Welcome everyone. It's a wrap with Rap. I'm your host, Ron Rappaport. Before we start, I would like to thank all of our listeners, supporters, and sponsors that have helped to make this podcast so successful. The podcast is being heard in all 50 states, all provinces of Canada, and over 60 countries around the world. The podcast has been ranked by Feedspot as one of the top 35 overcoming adversity podcasts on the web from thousands in that category and is ranked by traffic, social media, followers, and content freshness. Please visit the podcast website. It's a wrap with rap.com for all the episodes and other information regarding the podcast and order logo merchandise of which a portion of sales is donated to various charities and to sign up for our newsletter. This podcast features people who can, who have overcome life's challenges and adversities, people who can inspire, motivate, and educate us on an assortment of topics. My guest today is Eric Christensen. Eric is a documentarian, a seven-time Southwestern Emmy Award recipient whose four films focus on the impact of trauma on individuals, families, and communities. A trauma survivor himself, having lost his home in the Santa Barbara Painting Cave fire disaster, he understands trauma, the resilience of the human spirit, and how important hope is to heal. His new film, Unmasking Hope, follows a disparate group of people whose extraordinary stories of survivor, survival most of us have heard only in snippets on the news. Having lived through mass shootings, terror attacks, combat, and sexual assaults, these brave trauma survivors don masks to hide their pain and suffering as they navigate their new existence that is often stymied by PTSD, physical injury, and emotional turmoil. In order to heal, they must confront what's happened to them and begin their journey from seclusion to inclusion. As we follow their moving stories, we are all inspired to find hope again and be who we were born to be. NYU's Dr. Arya Shalev, one of the world's foremost experts on trauma, said, Eric is one of the very few who associate trauma with renewed hope, and this comes from his true understanding of the topic, his careful listening to trauma victims, and his true belief that things can change for them. By spotlighting these survivors and their journeys, Eric has been able to help unify a variety of audiences around the power of hope and educate the general population about the complexities of trauma. Eric has also produced for major networks, including Discovery, TLC, PBS, MTV, and an IMAX film. Welcome, Eric, to the podcast. Thank you, Ron. I'm very excited. I'm, uh, I'm excited to get these this back and forth going, and uh, and that's quite a quite a roll in. So, well, yeah, thank you well, so you've much. Got, you've got a lot of, uh, as we say, accolades. You know, we had to get them all in. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself growing up and what sparked your interest in filmmaking. You know, gosh, I, I don't really recall exactly what sparked my interest. I do recall having a, this dates me, a regular eight camera, not a super eight camera. And my dad got me a regular eight camera and it was much like, uh, the early Spielberg, um, film about his upbringing and, and uh, it, I actually had a switch in the dark, switch the reel over. So it was 25 feet long, so I would have 50 feet of film. But um, I, I just started making making films, with, you know, with my friends and things. And, uh, you know, at eight years old, I, I, I made my first film that had a script. And uh, I, I, I honestly recall as a youngster, making these films and knowing I had some sort of message, but <clears throat> I wasn't sure what message I hadn't found my message yet. And it, it took, it took a few years to to do that, but I, I made, that's what I did. I, I never had, wanted to do anything else other than to make films. That was your purpose on earth. Filmmaking. Telling yeah. Stories. yeah. And, 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 but it, it, it just, the, the patience and, and what it took and how the, you know, the turns it took, I, I didn't really know what my true calling was until quite some time later. Yeah. So did you make uh, films in high school and how did you break into the industry? Did you have a lot of challenges to overcome, to make filmmaking your profession and uh, what schooling did you pursue? You know, that's, that's a great question. And, you know, 
it, it's interesting to re reflect back on it now is that it, it took it took a lot of it took a lot of preparation it took a lot of you know you had to have the camera then you have to shoot with film and you don't even see what you've got until you take it in and then you have it developed then you get it back then you project it then you have to edit it and the editing was a very physical process and so i mean the bar was pretty high as far as like you couldn't just go out and shoot something with your phone it wasn't like that then so yeah it, it was it was a meticulous process but you know i started working professionally you know, I did my own films, but I started working professionally when I was about 13 years old because I was a big kid and I got in on sets and I started working as a PA professionally for other people. And um, and then that just progressed because that's what I wanted to do. And I found a mentor. I, I found several mentors along the way that helped me out and kind of showed me the ropes. And as I grew older, they introduced me to you know, other professionals and uh, my career built as, as you know, I, I improved my skills. And I ended up going to California Institute of the Arts in the 80s. And uh, I was already very established in my filmmaking. But CalArts not only taught me some more about filmmaking, but mainly it opened my mind about all the different disciplines all the different crafts there was dancers there was classical music there was fine art and and there was music and so i i was able to be involved in the process with all these other artists so i learned how to collaborate i learned how they fit in and it also opened my mind to what really is considered art and to flash forward with unmasking hope i kind of flash back to that i worked with dancers i worked with animators and but uh, it, it's been a process. Uh, did you have a lot of challenges along the way? Oh, yeah, definitely. And, you know, it's just, just climbing, just just getting the next gig and, 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 uh, and constantly evolving as an artist. Now, the real challenges came, I mean, working professionally is one thing. I kind of put that over here, the stuff I did for Discovery and all this other stuff. That that you know, once you're once you're in the place and you move forwards, it's pretty easy. When you're doing independent work, like my last four films, those were the biggest challenges. And the big challenges are obviously number one, funding. Yeah. And and working with funders and trying to figure out and then working on a budget, you know, and getting getting your vision on a budget. And uh you know, then then again, and then there's so many other challenges, especially in the particular calling that I landed in is working with the different survivors and learning how to work with them. And I've been again, I've been blessed with amazing mentors on that side, too, is very experienced clinicians from, you know, from Stanford University, Dr. Amit Ekin and Dr. Arya Shalev from NYU, you mentioned, and they they really mentored me in a clinical kind of approach. So I could work with these survivors of various traumas. Okay, and I will delve into that. So let's delve into your work concerning the subject of trauma. You are a trauma survivor yourself. Uh, you suffered through the Painted Cave fire disaster. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that time? Well, I, I was... I was actually doing extremely well in my career. I was editing at the time. I was doing a lot of national commercials and working, you know, at the top of my top of my uh, field, actually. But I also had a abnormal habit with drugs and alcohol, <laughs> and uh, before the fire. And then I remember that day, June twenty seventh, nineteen ninety. It was a very, very hot day in Santa Barbara. We had three days of triple digit temperatures, which never happened. And uh, after work, I was shooting pool and drinking beer and doing my normal stuff. And I look up in the foothills where my home is. And a friend of mine said, you know, we better get up there. It looks like that fire is coming down towards your house. And uh, at the time, I had a place and uh, it was a beautiful house. And uh, I had the lower floors. My mom lived in the top floor. She was up there. 
And um, we tried to make it up there and we could not make it up there because it was literally a firestorm. There was embers every, everywhere and uh, oh. it was out of control. And um, ironically, we were told just weeks prior to that from the fire department that our house was safe. You know, it had all the safeguards and the defendable space and no exposed beams and things like that. But they weren't expecting a firestorm. So that next morning I I got there and my home was gone. And that was um that was a big turning point for me. Um personally and professionally and, and what my work became after that. And um it took me seven months and uh and after that seven months, I kind of hit what you would say my bottom. So and, I, uh, I, I would say that's probably your rock bottom. Yes, exactly. And then I, I was able to, uh, the the woman that's my wife now gave me this gentleman's card, Don R. And I went to go see this gentleman and I ended up in the outpatient. But more importantly, I ended up going to a group um, that had other people like me, but they were recovered. And so I've been going to that group now for over 32 years. Wow. Well, <laughs> but, but that it's changed, helping. But that changed my life. And I got clean and sober and I made my first film about um about surviving trauma called Faces in the Fire, about surviving that fire. And uh that's where it all started from the fire. So it's a lot like uh a lot of people, you know, they get uh like in my case, cancer. And things pop, and all of a sudden you're you're in the cancer advocacy world, you know. Uh, and, and I could go down the list, you know, with all kinds of people and and their their traumas. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's not unusual. But thank God you you went into it. Now you create films that chronicle stories of trauma survivors that help those survivors heal through power, emotional storytelling uh tell us three ways storytelling can help erase the stigma for those suffering from mental health issues you know that's that's a great question because and i'll take that i'll take that question and i'm going to jump from the individual that's telling the story in the film to the individual that could be watching the film okay and number one for the individuals that are telling their story, and particularly the individuals in the film, when you tell your story to another person and the correct person that that actually wants to hear the story, that's open to hearing the story, it validates your experience. For me, when I work with a, a survivor and they're able to tell the tell me this story about what has happened to them, sometimes it's I'm the very first person that's heard the whole thing. And uh, and it validates that experience for them, which really grounds that whole experience and makes it real for them and helps them, as Dr. Meet Etkin says, kind of integrate the trauma into their life narrative. It's not about pushing the trauma away. It's about accepting it and bringing it into your life. So that, number one, it validates for them. And then number two, what happens is that... Uh, we have a screening of the film and people are able to see the film and they see themselves reflected on the film in the film. And then again, it validates and they see that their story is important, that somebody cared enough to put it in the context that other people are going to see it. Then the third thing that really happens that's most powerful. And then we flip over to the other side of the viewer too is when these individuals that are in the film, somebody sees their story and then they reach out to them and say, you know what, I just saw your story and I, I, I didn't survive 9-11, but your story so touched me and I connected that I feel that I can get over whatever obstacle or whatever trauma I've been through. So it completely completes this circle and the cycle for them that their trauma and what they'd went through isn't for it wasn't thrown away and it, it it means something and it's actually an asset to them and then on the other side of the screen I, i'm going into four different aspects of this on the other side of the screen the viewer hopefully it, it's a very inspiring and aspiring 
uh, connection that they have through empathy with these people in the film. That if if they can do that, man, I, I can do that too because I connect with something they've said. And time and time again, this has played out in in the four different films that I have done. So you said that uh, sometimes you're the uh, the first person that really listens to their story. Well, it's sometimes I, I'm the first person that's heard the whole story that in bits and pieces. A lot of survivors, you know, even if they've had therapy, I've I had one 9-11 first responder call me, you know, say, Eric, I really need to talk to you. I get this text and he calls me and says, you know, the way that you interviewed me and how we talked before and after that's never happened to me before. It's always been in a clinical situation. It's always been bits and pieces. And that was really the first time I was able to move through the whole thing with somebody that really, truly did care. And, yeah. um, and you know, it's just, it's not something before starting to tell your story, even if you're in therapy and stuff, There, it's normal or normal. I guess it is quite often the survivors downplay their own stories that's what it's i was like, going to ask you did, did some of the survivors not even want to talk about it you know it's just like it, it, it's a form it sometimes it's a it, it's kind of a form of uh you know survivor guilt whereas you know uh, it's pr particularly with some of the 9-11 survivors i interviewed you know, there, there's people that did not make it out. There's people that were horribly maimed. I made it out, you know, and, and so maybe, you know, and then, then they downplay their story and they don't want to talk about it because they're almost embarrassed of having made it out unscathed. In the film, Becky, the 9-11 survivor says, you know, I wish I would have been hurt because then it would have been a lot easier to explain what's going on now. Okay, so you're, you're answering my question for sure. Now, your first documentary you alluded to, Faces in the Fire, uh, has been uh, kind of a training tool. Tell us how your films have been used as educational tools. Well, particularly with Faces in the Fire, <clears throat> it, was, uh, it was seen by the people at the National Institute of Mental Health. And they said, oh, my gosh, that's exactly the debriefing kind of sequence The the questioning in the film and the interview format was very similar to what they would do and call debriefing for people that have went through a disaster. So they were easily able to pick up the film and then use it to train people that are coming into uh, a lot of times when there's a disaster in an area they'll get the local clinicians and therapists and they'll train them how to talk and speak and debrief the survivors of the incident and so they were able to use faces in the fire to show them what to expect how the debriefing goes etc cetera, etc cetera. um I also with my other film Home homecoming of vietnam vets journey and when later both my veterans films uh, searching for home coming back from war that was distributed to all the vet centers and how that really served especially homecoming of vietnam vets journey because it's based on a motorcycle run from california to the wall in washington dc a lot of veterans and vet vietnam veterans in particular do not want to talk about their experience in vietnam well we'll watch a movie about motorcycles and then about 20 minutes in they're like uh-oh this is about a lot more than motorcycles. So it kind of breaks that ice. And then they start to connect with the veterans in the film. And then they start to go through their own experiences. And then, you know, ideally, and that's why we do outreach and team with outside organizations. Ideally, after the ice is broken, I guess you would say, and those feelings start to come up, they they can reach out and work with a therapist or somebody or another veteran that's a little bit ahead of them in the healing. And that's how that kind of works. Yeah, I was going to, that's going to lead into my next question. So the fact that you were a trauma survivor yourself, 
Uh, has that opened doors conversing with other trauma survivors as opposed to just being an ordinary interviewer? And have you parlayed your personal experience surviving trauma in your work? I, I can only imagine uh, that when you come to see the survivors and you tell them, hey, I'm a survivor too. I went through, you know, the, uh, I'm sorry, is it the painted cave? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yes. I, it's almost like myself when I do advocacy work uh, for male breast cancer. Uh, I can stand there and people will pass me by and they'll look and they'll go, oh, okay. And, but when I stop them and I tell them that I'm a male breast cancer survivor, they immediately stop and they turn around and they say, oh, let me hear what you have to say. I'm very interested. So does that pretty much work the same way for you being a, a trauma survivor yourself? I, I believe it's God's biggest gift to me that I have this asset that can uh, now I can use to help others. And, uh, you know, it, it's 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 interesting. I, I call it the miracle of identification. You know, when when somebody goes, oh, <laughs> me, too. Yeah, you know, and uh, and then oh my gosh, all of a sudden you're, you know, you're you were that, you know. I love the analogy of we went down on the ship together and we shared the life raft. You know, we know what it's like, and then, but you know, and one of the things that's one of the purposes of my film, my films is to explain to the people that didn't go down with the ship that didn't sit in the life raft for using that analogy, right. what the experience is like. But going back to exactly what you're saying, you know, we're brothers and sisters that have went through the same thing. And that that miracle of, you know, identification is just so healing and exactly what you said, you know, and 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 God bless you, because my friend Mike B, um, he passed away a while ago, but um, he, he had male breast cancer, too. And he had a full mastectomy and everything. And and it's 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 such a interesting small niche but there's other men out there and and they're going to identify with other men that have went through it and yeah. it's the same with sur survivors and you know my, my 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 you know disaster losing my home it was all material things right it's what i did to myself through drugs and alcohol and took myself spiritually down to like the lowest it, it's that's the trauma i caused myself and now I live on a day-to-day -day basis in recovery. Yeah. And and that's where I can relate to the Vietnam vet when he says, I have to do this every day or I'm going to go crazy. And I'm like, oh, me too. <laughs> it's like, right. wow, okay. I mean, we, you know? yeah, we, uh, we've all seen uh, kind of, I want to say, in my in my situation, uh, possible death, mm -hmm. and and I can talk to somebody who has an alcohol problem, for example, and knows my situation. When we can talk just like brothers, I mean, we're it, it, there's yep. such there's such a relationship there, you know, because they know where I'm coming from, just like they knew where you were coming from. They it's knew you were the problem. real deal. You weren't some clinician. You weren't some guy who read it out of a textbook. You know, you actually experienced it. And, and that, I think that means all the world. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. And, you know, and that's where when people call me a filmmaker, I'm like, oh, tell me that. Because filmmakers, to me, like, already have an idea of what they're going to do. This is going to be the film, and this is what I want to get out of it. Yeah. And then they try to force that out of it. And uh, you can talk to the people that I interview. I let them tell their story and I want them to tell their story and then let it flow. And I I, 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 I like to be kind of a, a messenger and not a filmmaker. Gotcha, gotcha. So how are you able to create a unified message of hope among uh, such a diverse group of trauma survivors? Well, that's that's... Again, that's kind of multi-layered, but, you know, it, it's interesting is I'll, I'll go back to the real basics and I'll talk about like literally the editing of that. But, um, you know, physically, 
the art, the, the art form. But um, early on, I I kind of, I did discover with Facing the Fire, we interviewed like a dozen survivors. And I'm like, you know what? They're different. They're different genders. They're different races. They're different ages. They're different economic stratas. But they're kind of telling all the same stories. Yeah. You know, the, the analogies I like to use on that, because I love analogies, is, you know, everybody's on a cruise ship. And they're all doing their different things. You know, some are some are gambling, some are going to the pool, and some are going on excursions. But guess what? The cruise ship is going to end up in the same place. And that's kind of like recovery in a, in a way. We're all doing a bunch of different things, but that's, the main arc is the same. And so talking about a unified vision of hope, they're all talking about the same thing. No matter if it's Lyman Montgomery, who was sexually molested when he was eight years old or a 9-11 survivor that ran from tower two their stories miraculously kind of mesh because even though it was radically different they're kind of on the same boat i guess you would say yeah of this healing curve and this and this quest for hope you know so that that's one side of it and i think that's kind of a uh spiritual kind of side too of it of, of how we heal spiritually and and uh that kind of function but the other function too is literally in the edit suite you know um when when we get the first the first run through the first cut always has for me i i felt i told the 9 11 story uh, of the incident and it's like over halfway over like 40 minutes long and i'm like well the, the movie's not about the incident every movie i make it's you know with going back to homecoming and vietnam best journey i i oh i 40 minutes of their experience in vietnam but we don't want to hear about the incident we try to cut that all down and to make the film different we want to tell about the recovery and the hope right right if my film isn't like less than a third of the incident and then two thirds of hope and recovery, I haven't, I haven't achieved what I'm going out to do. So that's how I kind of get this unified feeling of hope uh, on those two different levels. Uh, your new film, Unmasking Hope, uh, tell us about that film and the meaning of the title and speak about the masking concept you use in the film. Well, oh, that's a, <laughs> great. You know, Unmasking Hope, is uh this gosh is a spiritual evolution of and 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 also artistic evolution of all my other work um going back to this idea that we all kind of heal the same you know all my other my last two films were all about the veterans experience about military trauma and i'm like you know i really want to mix it up there is a veteran in unmasking hope but I really wanted to mix it up this time. And I, I call it my thesis. I'm like, let's get 9-11. Let's get mass shooting survivors. Let's have our veteran. Let's have sexual abuse and, and see if this happens. And uh, that was kind of the thesis of the whole film. And going to the idea of the title, Unmasking Hope, let's, we'll, we'll, I'll answer your last question first, I guess, is the concept of masking is in clinically they call it a persona a persona that um when we go through an incident we put this persona on and it's just like it, it, it it's not it covers us up it, it works it actually works for a while and it's it's a function you know for us as survival for the mom that's went through something terrible, she has to put on that persona of the mom that's going to get things done and get the kid out the door and get their lunch done and everything. And they put that mask on just to get it done. But it's when that mask and that persona doesn't come off. It's when it gets in the way. It's when it gets overused. It, it, it ends up as alcoholism. It ends up as, you know, workaholic. It ends up as abuse and comes out in lots of different ways. So it's about losing that mask, starting to heal, starting like we're going back to what we're talking about, rebuilding our narrative, talking about our story, understanding with honesty what happened to us, 
that starts to take that mask away. And I'd like to say, you know, we go back to who we were. We don't necessarily go back to who we were, but hopefully we go back to a new, better version of ourselves once we lose that mask. And that's unmasking hope. So why do you think uh, your new film, Unmasking Hope, is so important in today's world? And why chronicling stories of trauma survivors is so important right now? Uh, you know, I, I think there's two, again, there's like two levels to that is one thing I think we're we're in a uh, a crisis of empathy. I think everything has gotten crushed down by social media into 30 second bites. We don't have enough time to be empathetic. We have to make up our mind about an issue in 30 seconds or less. They're right. I'm wrong. It's this way. Those people are that way. It's just empathy takes time. And empathy is makes us vulnerable because true empathy and not just sympathy True empathy is trying to understand the other individual and their situation and their emotional situation. And that's really tough with all the issues right now. Nothing beats face to face. And that's why I try to put a face on all these things so people can see, people can understand. And, and so hopefully it promotes empathy. And that's, you know, that's that's one part of um of unmasking hope the other part is that right now there is so much talk about trauma there's so much but hardly anybody's talking about the hope it's just like everything is well this caused me trauma this traumatized me and and now perhaps i need medication or perhaps i need this and this and i want to try to tell a story of hope on the other side and try to flood the market <laughs> if I ever could, with the idea of hope and recovery instead of dwelling on the problem, just much like my editing is. I got to cut, I got to cut the incident down and stop dwelling on where the towers fell and how dramatic it was and just get to the hope on the other side and how we're, we're healing after, after the disaster. So that's, that's well, my feeling. You know, you talked about empathy and I always, uh, I always try to give hope on the on the podcast and in our Facebook group and things like that. And I always tell people, you have to have empathy. You don't know what that person standing or sitting next to you is going through. You have mm -hmm. no idea. I mean, that person could be way down in the dumps and just trying to make it through the day. And you know, it just leads to kindness as well. You know, and that's just something I think is lacking right now. It just is. You know, and it's it just, it comes down to love and tolerance, you know, and it's it's just not, it, it, it just, with all these issues, if we could actually look the issue in the eye, which is quite sometimes another human, and sit with them, I think our minds would change about everything. Yeah. In absentia, when we're sitting by ourselves, reading blips on social media, man, it's easy to get our mind going and that hate going. Yeah. You know, it, the love and tolerance and empathy is very, very difficult. And uh, it, it's a it's a practice, you know? So, yeah. you know, for all the people listening, start practicing love and tolerance. Absolutely. Replace that, replace that instant anger with, wait, hold on what would it be like to be in their shoes? You know? Exactly, exactly. I mean, you could look at uh, somebody, you know, with a sign, I don't know, you know, wanting help or whatever on the street, and, and you'll hear all kinds of snide remarks. And I'll say, hey, well, you don't know what that person, you know, what, what he does, where, where he came from, where she came from, you know, back off and, you know, mm -hmm. have some empathy. Uh, what what are some of the unique challenges of interviewing the trauma survivors? And, and just talk about uh, the trigger effect on survivors and how you dealt with that. How do you how do you get around that? You know that that is a big issue. And you know one of the I, I'm very very careful about who's on the crew. Um, that 
that the energy is right for lack of a better word in in the space that we're working in i also pre-interview and spend a lot of time a lot of these people become friends of mine and uh for example molly who actually went through two mass shootings i was just texting with her mom she's in uh, new orleans uh right now <laughs> getting an award for her advocacy for mass shooting survivors and her work working with peers. And so I get to be real good friends with them. So going back to your question, you know, it's it's just, it's accepting their story in a very uh, transparent and unjudging way. And um, I have, I definitely have a gift for that. You know, Dr. Meet Ekin said that, you know, I use sophisticated clinical technique in my interviews and i'm like hmm, that's interesting because i just think i really listen and love on these people <laughs> yeah. yeah you know and, that, and yeah. that's me. and and yeah. the other thing is if you notice in the film when Mon unmasking hope talking about triggers and we like that i was corrected when i was using the word triggers is that's kind of not the acceptable word anymore, especially around mass shooting survivors. So we call it activations. Okay. Activation. <laughs> so, I have to remember so that. Why, yeah. So <laughs> why getting activated in my films, we kind of use an ethereal, analogous kind of, they're not reenactments, but we use animation and we use dance. Yes. Try to explain some of this. But the interesting thing is when you do that and you're not showing the actual incident or showing something that could activate an individual is you're actually expanding and reaching deeper because art has a way of kind of leaving a lingering question that leads you down a trail and a link uh, with a lingering question. And that's why there's dance and animation in this film. And I, I believe it's very, very effective without actually being an activator. Now, your previous films uh, you alluded to, Homecoming, A Vietnam Vet's Journey, and Searching for Home, uh, for Home, Coming Back from War, have been transformative in the recovery process for thousands of people uh, whose lives have been compromised mentally, spiritually, and physically by trauma. Now, Searching for Home, Coming Back from the War, Coming Back from War, has aired more than 2,300 times nationally on PBS tied to Memorial Day and Veterans Day. Can you just tell us briefly about those two films? Well, Homecoming came like several years after Facing the Fire. And that Facing the Fire made my mark in the documentary world. Then I got picked up by a couple producers. And then I directed films for AT&T, for Staples, and all this stuff for public television. And um, <clears throat> but nothing was really kind of satisfying because it wasn't the core that I do. But people are like, oh, do that warm, fuzzy thing that you did with. And so um, Homecoming kind of walked right into my lap when a good friend of mine in a men's group uh, mentioned that his mom had passed away and he had a lot of stuff coming up. And he is a Vietnam vet and he was thinking of going on this motorcycle pilgrimage is what he called it. And uh, in like. Oof. about a month later i was on that run with him with a you know with a small crew documenting you know five different vietnam vets going across the united states getting the welcome home they never got you know at that time 25 to 30 years ago now it's even longer but um so that that's how that kind of happened and then i found that's when i really found my footing on public television and then it was several years later when we had started having new conflicts in the Middle East. I was approached by um, uh, uh, Dr. Jeremy Crosby, who was working at the Walter Mondale VA in Kansas. And he said, it's time that you do another film. And so I mixed it up then even more and tried to progress and had veterans of all different wars and generations talking about their assimilation back into society after wartime. And uh, and that ended up being a very, Searching Chrome coming back from war ended up being a very successful film. As, as we said, it's 
probably over 2,500 showings now. And um, I think it is still on public television, but also um, our uh, distributor Gravitas has Searching for Home coming back from war and it's free on YouTube right now through Gravitas. And so you could watch that film there. Okay. But it was very successful, and it was there again. It was used by vet centers all over the United States, and it still is, to work with um, some of these veterans. Now, through your uh, vast experience, Eric, uh, dealing with trauma, please tell us three ways uh, to detect someone who might be suffering from a mental health disorder, and one of the most powerful uh, message you can give them to help. Gosh, three signs. You know, it, it, they all kind of come back to one thing is isolation. You know, and, and that's like one of the biggest red flags for somebody is when when they have a change and, and they all kind of roll in and end up with isolation, a change, a radical change in behavior, things that they used to like to do and stuff. They're not coming out and joining you anymore. They're 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 not the same person and then you know they then again you know that's one two right there and then isolation and isolation is a killer and so to jump to you know your, the last part of that question is one of the best things is to be a good ear to be somebody that truly doesn't just hear but they listen with their heart and sometimes it's, it's it, this drives me crazy and, and i'll just tell you this when when you go into the hospital and you see somebody that's gravely ill or, or and you sit down with them you don't ask what's wrong right you just kind of you end up holding space and you can talk about anything talk about football talk about whatever and then when if you are there with the right intention and you create this space, then they'll be able to talk. It's sometimes that intentional, I'm going to help them out and say something. That isn't the way to actually go about it. When your friend's hurting, it's, it's the best thing is just to be there. And then when the time is right, they'll start to talk about it and then do not judge and just take it in. And if you've had any experience yourself similar to it, then maybe you can comment. But don't offer advice if you don't know. Don't don't go there. Just say, I'm hearing you, and write it out with them. And I call that holding space. And, Good you advice. know, that's one of the best ways to do it, you know, because it drives me crazy when people, a good friend of mine and my mentor was passing away in the hospital. And this guy comes in. I was just sitting there with John. And John was starting to talk to me and everything. And a good friend of mine, not a friend, but a, a, this guy comes in, John, what's wrong with you? And they think it helps him. He, you know what? He'll tell you when the time is and he doesn't want to run through it again. You know, so it goes back to the survivor. They'll tell you their story if they want to, you know, but be there and be available with your heart and your energy. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Eric, uh, where can the films be obtained? As I said, Searching for Home, Coming Back from War. I'm very excited that, you know, it's been out for almost almost eight years now, but it's still, it's still very viable. That's on YouTube. So Searching for Home, Coming Back from War. You can just Google it, and it is on YouTube. Gravitas, my distributor, has done a great job getting it out there. Um, Homecoming and... Faces in the Fire is a little bit harder to find on YouTube, but you can. But my latest film, Unmasking Hope, is available on, um, it, it's actually showing in New Orleans on PBS this, this month. But for most people, download the PBS app, Passport app, or the PBS app, just like you would Netflix, onto your smart TV, your tablet, and then put in Unmasking Hope. Oh, okay. And it, it's streaming on the PBS app, and uh, it's super easy. It looks great on the app. And guess what? It's different than downloading Netflix on your smart TV because 
like three months later, you're not, your wife isn't going to go, Hey, it's seven 99. What are we paying for? We haven't watched this. PBS is free. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and there's um, other great content on PBS too. There's yeah. some great content. Okay. So everybody out there, uh, load that PBS app up. Any new projects in the works, Eric? You know, that's a great question. Um, being a grand, being a grandpa, is that a project? Uh, yeah, you know, that's a project. You know, you asked about the challenge in, in things, you know, it, it, and I'm not old, you know, I'm paddle boarding. I, I'm, you know, I'm getting back into surfing. I'm doing everything. I'm diving in the Pacific every day, you know, but, but honestly, I, I don't, my unmasking hope took four years. Searching for home, coming back for war it took eight years. So I don't really, God has something probably planned for me, but right now he had me and my wife being a grandma and grandpa and, uh, you know, and uh, making a little bit, <laughs> a bit more money because uh, doing my second job, because uh, documentary is not a huge economic uh, <laughs> leverage there. So, but yeah, mainly just being the, uh, being with my family and, and, and moving forwards because after four films in the last 30 years uh i think i think that's pretty good yeah i mean people probably have this idea uh that you just you know get your camera out and you shoot and bam 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 there it is no big deal i mean they think probably putting on a podcast you know you you talk to somebody and you know it, it's a little more involved than that you know that when when my film Searching for Home Com Coming Back from War came out, um, our distributor did a great job, and we were on iTunes. And on Veterans Day, we were on the front page of iTunes, you know, and and uh, you know the movies and stuff. And uh, a friend of mine is like, and he's even in the industry. He goes, you going to buy a new car with those residuals? And I'm like. No, I'm gonna probably pay for the website and to keep this thing alive with the residuals. <laughs> and if I have any extra money, it's gonna go back into keeping this thing alive. So yeah, exactly, <clears throat> exactly. Uh, where can uh, people contact you? Um, actually, if uh, ecproductions.com, you can get the uh, go there, and there's all sorts of different ways to contact me. And unmaskinghopethemovie.com um also uh unmasking hope on instagram and facebook too so okay so it's I'm, EC... not big, I'm not a big social i'm not a big social media person okay ecproductions.com yeah that's all my work okay and yeah. and unmasking hope the movie the movie dot com yep dot com we'll put that in the uh podcast Great. notes Okay, I want to thank you so much, Eric, uh, for being on the podcast and educating us on all this terrific work you have done and are doing to help trauma survivors. Uh, your lifelong commitment to creating films and that help people heal through powerful emotional storytelling is definitely a godsend. And uh, any new stuff uh, coming out or whatever, uh, we'd love to have you back on the podcast. Well, thank you. I appreciate it, Ron. And, you know, for your viewers... You know, give Unmasking Hope a, a a watch on your PBS app and share it with other people and then give me a shout out. I want to hear what you think. Absolutely. I, I saw the film and it, it, it's just awesome. So everybody uh, who's listening to this, uh, get out there and and give it a give it a view. Uh, comments and suggestions uh, for the podcast, you can email me. At it's a wrap with wrap at gmail.com. Our website is it's a wrap with rap.com. Our Facebook group, uh, we have a couple thousand people in there now. It's a wrap with rap. Instagram, it's a wrap with rap podcast. We're on Twitter at rapper, W R A P P E R 130. All the episodes are on YouTube. So uh, they're on YouTube at it's a wrap with rap, the podcast on cut. Want to thank everyone for listening. Please stay safe. And for now, it's a wrap. <laughs>